what you see is an ICO model 369 sweep generator. It's a uh, kind of an artifact of the of the 1960s. These were used to align primarily television sets, although they were also used to sweep align uh, FM radios. They're still used for the latter, but of course the sweep alignment of TV sets is, uh, is a thing of the past. The switch over to digital TV, uh, and frankly even before that the use of uh, ceramic filters had pretty much removed the need to align TV. So unless you're into vintage television, uh, these sweep generators are really uh, pretty much out of the picture. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of them a little later in this video. But you may wonder, why am I talking about sweep generators now when uh, in my last video I promised that I would show demodulator probes used to extend the frequency response of the analog discovery. Well, I do intend to get along to that issue, but I think I'm going to put that off by at least one video. Instead, because of some viewer questions and some comments, I thought it might be a good idea to at least talk about sweep generators so you'll understand why the demodulator probes were made the way they were uh, and and also some of the reasons why when you look at things like specifications you find that the RF specification for a demodulator probe is quite different than the actual frequency response of the probe. In other words, the, the audio frequency or baseband, and we'll talk about that when we look at the uh, use and the schematics. But before I get on to that, I also want to show you a little segment that I actually did yesterday on uh, a couple of probes, including the, the one that I had in the original video, and a new one that I dug up. So let me show you that one first, and then we'll talk a little bit about sweep generators and finally end up by talking about demod probes as an introduction to why the old ones are different from the new ones. In a previous video, I talked about demodulator probes and I extolled the virtues of the one on the right there, the one in the uh, with the metal covering. And at the time I said this was an ICO probe. It's not. I found out it's actually a Heath probe uh, for a Heath kit. The one on the left is an ICO probe, and I'll show you the schematics in a, in a little bit. But what I wanted to show you is the difference in the performance between these two. Now what I have is a 10 megahertz, I think, yeah, 10 megahertz RF signal. I chose 10 megahertz because that was sort of a common upper frequency of the day. That was the IF, uh, it was around the IF frequency of FM receivers in the 50s and so uh, still used today. And uh, with a 1 kilohertz modulating signal. And then I put both probes together. So let's take a look on the scope up here and what at the waveforms that they display. And as you'll see, the now I have this is the modulated signal at the bottom, and then this is the demodulated signal from uh, one probe, and this is the demodulated signal from the other. This is the signal from the 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 probe that I call the dinosaur bone, which is actually the Heath kit, uh, and the uh, sensitivity of the scope is set to the same, 500 millivolts per uh, division for, for both of these channels. So you'll notice that the Heathkit probe produces a signal that's about almost three times as much as the ICO probe. And when we look at the schematic, we may see a, a reason why that that's true. But basically, these are two probes of the day that were commonly used. So what's the purpose of a sweep generator and why did you need a demodulator probe? Well, the idea of a sweep generator was to provide what was called a visual alignment procedure. In other words, you would sweep a frequency across from 
low frequency to high frequency. And you could see the response of the circuit. Now, in the early days of radio, this wasn't as important, back in the days of just AM. But when FM came along, and of course, especially when television came along, this became a very important thing because the ability to reproduce a good TV signal depended on being able to align the IF section and the RF section to produce a response something like this. You may notice it's not peaked in the middle. It's actually peaked at two frequencies apart from the middle, and it's relatively flat in between those frequencies, and then it falls off. <clears throat> so the idea of a sweep generator was to sweep from one frequency to another and all the frequencies in between, and then you, you displayed that on a scope, and if the sweep of the scope was synchronized to the sweep of the generator, you would get a pattern very much like this. In order to reduce cost, what many manufacturers did is they used a circuit very much like this one. This is the 369. And I'll show you this in a little expanded view in a minute. They would take a tap off of the power transformer and use it to drive either a, uh, in some cases they used a motor, in some cases a solenoid. This particular generator uses what's called a saturable core reactor. Let's take a look at that in a little more a little more depth and you'll see that what we're doing is they're taking the AC signal and then uh, that AC signal is applied across these two points. Then they tap a portion of that through this potentiometer and send it over to these windings. The windings are a saturable reactor and then this saturable reactor was in the resonant circuit of the oscillator. So essentially, as the AC line would rise and fall, the frequency of the this tuned circuit would rise and then fall. So that is how they actually did sweep. Now, here is how the sweep generator would be connected up. Over here is the scope. This is the sweep generator. And then in between, there would be a set of components. The RF, the swept RF, would come out and would go through some kind of matching pad to match the, the uh, impedance to whatever point in the TV you were, you were attaching this. And then, depending on whether this was before or after the detector of the TV or the FM receiver or whatever, you may or may not need what's called a broadband detector. Now that basically is just a demodulator probe. Notice it's a diode, uh, a Pi network filter, and, and then that is uh, applied to the demodulation end of the sweep generator. The demodulation in and the sweep signal were applied to the scope. The, the sweep was applied to the horizontal trace to sweep the beam back and forth across the screen, and the response from the demod was applied to the vertical to sweep things up and down, so that you would wind up with a curve that looks like this. So now let's look at some DMOD probes. After the earlier video in which I was using what I called the dinosaur bone, this probe over here, I decided to take it apart to see how it was built. And this is the little sketch of the circuit that I found. It has a diode, uh, an input capacitor of about 150 picofarads, a 10K and a 27K resistor, and then a 1 nanofarad or a 0.001 microfarad capacitor on the output. Now, uh, I then looked around 
to see if I could find that particular probe anywhere. And I found it on the uh, internet. Here is an exploded view, and this is basically what I found inside the probe that I was working with. And it came with a schematic, which I'll show you an expanded view here, and you'll see it's essentially the same as I found inside. In other words, 150 uh, picofarad, in the day they called it micro-microfarad, a capacitor, a diode to ground, a 27K and 10K resistor, and a 0.001 microfarad capacitor. So I, I then knew that what I had was the uh, exact same probe that I was working with here. Well, that actually is a Heath. It's called a 337C Heath Kit Demodulator Probe. And so this was originally intended, and actually my, the first sweep generator I ever owned was a Heath. I have since then owned a number. One of them is this unit by Leader, which, by the way, I think is one of the best sweep generators of the day. I used it for FM alignment and other things. I still have this, and it can't, comes with a variety of probes and other things. The Another good one that I used was the Sencor SG165. Now, this one is only uh, useful for the uh, for AM or and FM, and the sweep only really works on FM. They call it a stereo analyzer because it has the power meters and the other things, but among other things, it has a sweep generator. And then a later model of that Sencor was called the SG80, which was the, uh, they called the AM stereo, FM stereo analyzer, and that added the uh, the AM stereo to the FM stereo. Now this one says AM FM stereo analyzer, but the stereo is only for FM. The SG80 added AM stereo, which really never caught on. But nonetheless, this is one of those that uh, you can use. And for those of you that have seen my other videos, you know I tend to keep it at hand because I use it for aligning uh, FM tuners, or at least checking the response of FM tuners. It's the unit there at the bottom. So uh, let's now talk about the demodulator probe circuits and what the frequency response is and why. Let's go back to this one and we'll get an idea of what will happen. Now of course the RF is applied here. The coupling capacitor is chosen to to be a very low impedance at the RF frequencies. But what it does is it imposes a low frequency limit on the RF signal. But understand there's a difference between the RF signal at this side and the response of the probe to that. And the demodulated signal on this side and the response of the probe to that. This is primarily the frequency response, that is the low frequency response, is determined by this capacitor. And normally that runs from 100 or so kilohertz up. The reason is there's very little that you want to demodulate that is below 100 kilohertz. Most of the IFs and the AM broadcast band, FM, uh, IFs, and so on, are well above 100 kilohertz. So usually these probes would only go down to around 100 kilohertz. And of course, they're limited at the high end by straight capacitance and other things. However, the audio output or the demodulated output is predominantly determined by this capacitor and the input impedance of the scope you're using it with. So that is why that you, if you see a probe, you have to be careful when you're buying a probe on the internet because if they specify the frequency response in terms of the RF, it might say 100 kilohertz to 450 megahertz, for example. That's basically what 
uh, a probe like the one that I called the dinosaur bone would do. Although a lot of them wouldn't work very well, much above about 300 megahertz. But this capacitor and the filter that is formed by these resistors, uh, along with that capacitor and the input impedance of the scope, limits the output frequency response to around, in this case, around 6 kilohertz. Back in the day, that didn't matter, because if you used a sweep rate of 60 cycles per second, the output only had to operate well at 60 hertz. If you were looking at an audio signal, say in an AM radio, well, most of those only went up to about 5 kilohertz. So generally, these probes were built back in the day to work from somewhere below the lowest IF, which in the day was around 260 kilocycles. So in other words, 100 kilocycles or kilohertz was a good low frequency range for the RF. And for the baseband or audio, a good frequency range was from somewhere below 60 cycles up to around 5 or 6 kilohertz. And that is basically what this probe does. And so the one you see over there is this kind of probe from the 60s. Now, earlier I also showed this probe, an ICO demodulator probe, that I also had in my stock. I wound up having to change the connector, and I think I'll kind of close this uh, by talking about this because this is something that once again if you didn't uh, work on this equipment back in the day like dinosaurs like I did you won't recognize this connector. This is the connector that was on that probe. It now has a BNC connector. This is what was called an amphenol and I'll unscrew the, the barrel a little bit here so you can see this part unscrews. Let me get it to focus a little bit. You notice that there's no center conductor, uh, or at least no pin sticking out. Now that's different from what is called a UHF connector. These two will go together. In other words, this, the threads on this will fit the same as the threads on this. They'll both fit the same connector, but without this pin, and by the way, this is called a 259. The plug was called a PL259, and the socket was called an SO259. So, but they're different from this. This was called an amphenol, and it was primarily intended back in the day to attach microphones to audio amplifiers, PA systems, things like that. So be careful if you are working with a connector like this that you don't try to use it in place of, what, of these UHF connectors, the 259s, because you do not have this pin. So at any rate, that is why I replaced that connector with a BNC, is so I could use it with a little more modern scope like the one up here, the, uh, the Rigol. And that is what I'm also going to be using when I move on to doing the analog discovery experiments with the modulator probes. So once again, I hope this has all been interesting uh, and useful, or, or maybe one of those. If so, I appreciate you watching. Hope you'll stay tuned for some future videos. But in the meantime, I want to wish you a nice day.